Looks like we have a small crowd today. Um, we've got a couple, couple topics um, that people have added to the to the agenda for our, our open agenda call um, here at the NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group. Um, this is the second of uh, our open agenda calls for 2019. Um, and just sort of a, a freewheeling kind of discussion with this lively crowd here of everyone. Um, maybe we get a couple more people. Um, and it, it's just sort of an op open, open agenda. It says, it says um, anything that, that people want to talk about infrastructure related that might be um, issues you're dealing with at your own organization, um, or just sort of research topics that you're interested in, um, infrastructure wide and tall. Um, if you haven't already, please do add your uh, self to the uh, agenda um, attendance. And I will add that link again in the chat. Um, I did get an email from Corey that is him on the phone, but he doesn't have uh, a working head headphone, so he's just listening. Um, but so we have um, a couple different topics um, to start us off with. Um, one of them has a subtopic, two subtopics, um, but preservation storage for. Um, Born digital collections, um, and I'd say this probably would apply for digitized collections as well. Um, but where you, you know, where your new preservation storage environment, where there is known um, sensitive content or known PII, um, what are the pros and cons there from? sort of an information security or system security perspective um, of distributing that content for either backup purposes or preservation purposes. Um, you know, distributed digital preservations often, um, you know, a, a, a practice that, that's recommended, um, but is your content encrypted? Um, and if not, um, what does that mean for this type of material? Um, and less talked about, I think, is backup. You know, is, is this stuff worked its way through, especially centralized storage environments, if it's on, on tape? Think about all the hands that that goes through in your centralized infrastructure. Um, if there's different people who are working on those systems and these tape systems, and it might go through a courier to a other storage facility where it's managed by other individuals. And presumably these people all deal with secure content and perhaps have some sort of sign off or agree to some sort of security um, type of situation. Presumably, do we know? Um, how does GDPR impact distributed digital preservation of storage nodes contain sensitive information about EU citizens and are located abroad? Um, so let's just uh, leave it leave it there for digital preservation storage and uh, sensitive materials, and see what people have to say. I'm going to mute so I can type and take notes for the lively discussion that I know will ensue, uh, and you don't have to hear my typing. I can just jump in and say that at Kentucky, while we don't have. Um, Basically, our sensitive born digital materials are oral history content. Um, and so we're pretty cautious about where we put that content um, for backup purposes and for preservation purposes. So we, um, one of the reasons why we decided to set up an in-tape, or excuse me, an in-house LTO tape machine is so that we can back up that content there um, because we know exactly who can touch that content. Um, and who has access to that content, as well as the inventories for that content, because we keep that locally. Um, so that has been a big lifesaver for us because usually, like there's a campus-wide tape backup system, and then of course we have Glacier and other um, 
other sort of local preservation tools, but our LTO tape um, is where we put all of that sensitive content. And we don't like, so we do push, um, just for backup purposes, we push content to Google Drive, but we don't push our oral histories there. So that's been a good investment for us. I'll just chime in here. This is <clears throat> Nathan Girth at the University of Nevada, Reno. And we recently actually had to deal with issues related specifically to uh, having to track down uh, restricted material from a collection that was uh, not necessarily stored in a distributed preservation environment where we pushed to the cloud or to Glacier or something along those lines. Um, but we did have to track it down through the various iterations of backup that were present through the centralized storage array here on campus. Um, we didn't necessarily have the, because of internal politics more than anything else, the opportunity to stand up an LTO machine or something like that for this collection. Plus given the, uh, the size of the collection, we're talking about 10 terabytes and roughly 11 million digital objects. Um, we just needed something more robust, but um, it definitely spoke the experience that we had that is to uh, to the necessity of really sitting down with systems teams and understanding those hands that things get handed off to or the machines involved. Um, especially since in this case, and I can't get into specifics given the nature of the collection and the parties that were involved. Um, but we really legally needed to know all of that information and have it very well documented. Um, it's something that I think was widely understood here in the institution, but now we have a, a firm sense of what that is um, in terms of the process that the array goes through to, to push this um, in, through its own kind of uh, distribution nodes. Um, not necessarily to take, but in our case, uh, uh, to, to Las Vegas or to another local data center. And, and so I think that, um, well, I can't necessarily speak to the pros and cons of, uh, of distributing more widely because we, we don't. Um, I think our, we're in line with Kentucky in that sense, um, with, at least with these very sensitive collections, in this case, a congressional collection. Um, we, uh, I would definitely say that our experience speaks to the necessity of having just really in-depth uh, knowledge of, of everyone who touches the array, everyone who has access to it, and the processes that are ongoing so that at the very least, uh, when they change, they let us know because recently they did change from pushing to uh, a mirror site in, in a, a center that we had in Vegas to, to more local storage that, that we had and we needed to know that. And so I think that um, we've definitely you know, operated with a, a great degree of caution with a lot of those materials, um, in part because we can't guarantee that the PII isn't there, even when we scan it. Um, but uh, we we learned the, I, I wouldn't say the hard way, but we definitely learned our lesson with regard to having really spot on documentation regarding even the local practices that are in place. When did you guys have all of that documentation in place was it before the collection even was transferred to your servers like were you able to have those conversations beforehand or did that happen sort of as part of the donation process or afterwards so um <clears throat> i'll quote our dean here in saying that we've been going through the process of crossing a bridge as we build it um <clears throat> i say that in part because the, the collection was acquired in 2016 i was hired last year in 2018 so there was two years of this collection living in the wild. Uh, we, we moved very quickly after I arrived to start um, building out that, um, that knowledge base. I think for any future collections that we would acquire, um, that would be baked into the documentation as part of the acquisition process. I feel much more comfortable about that. Um, all the more so because I just don't think that there was a lot of um, thought about the implications of certain types of material that we were receiving. Um, it, it, infrastructure wise, you know, a collection this size um, had uh, kind of odd quirks to it as well beyond the PII. Um, storing it in a, a block storage environment as opposed to an object store was a, a big 
um, uh, a, a big decision that had tremendous uh, fallout for us because it ends up taking up more space in the storage array than than just the digital objects would otherwise if they were stored in an object store, um, which is not an uncommon problem. But when you're dealing with so many objects, it's it's a it's a bigger issue. But we also would have had more, I think, in depth conversations about the um, uh, about the sensitivity issue. Um, I'm not sure. I think that people defaulted in this case to talking about you know, things like social security numbers, maybe some medical records, things like that. Um, I would have preferred that they had more discussions about, you know, broader security related issues, you know, the likes of which you typically see in these collections where there, there might be federally protected materials, national security materials, things like that, that we need to be more conscious of. Um, and those all have pretty profound implications for the, the storage environment you can put these things in. Um, not the you know not that they mandate the storage environment take a certain shape, but be um, they have implications because you you may have to track down and eradicate all the copies of something, um, which in certain backup and um, distributed systems can be difficult if not impossible, depending on how they package their information. So yeah, we we didn't have those discussions up front the the way that I think we would have preferred, but I. Hopefully we've laid the groundwork for having better discussions moving forward. Just um, sort of, can folks hear me? That's Corey here. Yep. Oh, great. Um, and sorry for the wind noise, but I'm just wondering, just like in terms of um, if your infrastructure was on something like Amazon, would you feel comfortable with their ability to report back? Um, in terms of keeping things secure, or is, it, is this really just a case of having to have uh, control with uh, with local copies? I'm just there's a lot of folks out there. I'm you know where the infrastructure has moved to the cloud, and we can talk through that a little bit. I'll say that different people within our institution feel differently about that, and so we default to the main content manager and their feelings about that. Um, and at that time, that person is the, the fallout for just the few number of oral histories that we have that are extremely sensitive would be so bad that it's just not worth it. So. I, I will chime in here too, Corey, and this is a discussion that recently came up at CNI. Uh, it, it seems to me that with, with cloud storage, there are a couple of different scenarios. I mean, there are definitely institutions that have robust direct connections to the pools of data that they're pushing into the cloud. And they have personnel that, that fundamentally understand what's going on there. And, and then there are institutions, you know, and I, I think we'd probably fall into this latter category where there are layers of people that exist between, you know, us and, uh, and the cloud, you know, so we're pushing through Dura cloud or we're pushing through in another case um, for one of our pipes. Uh, through a proprietary package that uh, that the Isilon that EMC makes available for Isilon customers to push things to AWS, I think it's the the layered aspect of that that can sometimes give us pause because we don't necessarily understand everybody that's in play, and even if we understand their policies, we don't necessarily understand all their processes. So sometimes that can be a bit of an issue as well. Um, it might change as we get more comfortable with those layers. But I think in the, in the near term, it's, that, it's the fact that we're not plugging in directly and that we're not controlling those pipes that gives us some, uh, some degree to be cautious, at least in the near term. Yeah, that makes sense. Here in Plus. Spain, uh, at least at my university and uh, most universities I know, uh, for uh, um, content that is uh, sensitive, they all decide to storage locally and to be controlled by their own IT teams. There is no, uh, at least as far as I know, uh, there is no trust in outside vendors to manage their sensitive contents. Maybe uh, we buy, we buy um, commercial solutions for digital preservation, but as far as I know, no administration would allow, allow 
their sensitive contents to be storage outside their, their own organization. That's uh, the case in Spain. For public administration mainly. Mm. Out of curiosity, Corey, and I don't know if you're gonna be able to chime in with the wind noise you have, uh, just building on that, that comment from Eduardo, uh, I, I know that in, in certain Canadian provinces, there are different legal restrictions on privacy and clearances that people need to um, <clears throat> address before pushing things to the cloud. Is that something that you've encountered in the Canadian context? Yeah, definitely. Um, the use of commercial infrastructure is very limited, um, but it's sort of interesting. And uh, um, Eduardo, I really appreciate your insights from Spain. Um, Within the Canadian context, we are being pushed by large, um, uh, basically through NAFTA and other uh, trade agreements, um, being pushed by large American companies to open, um, to just sort of to weaken some of the jurisdictional uh, data flow regulations and legislation. So that might actually change over time. But it's, you know, it's really interesting. We actually have out of the University of British Columbia, a cloud service provider that, um, you know, it's intended for um, use by uh, universities and colleges within British Columbia. And we have uh, an instance of Archivematica running as a service uh, on, that, on that cluster. And um, the University of Victoria, just uh, 30 kilometers away, um, we ran into issues with our privacy um, impact assessment process where uh, the university was not comfortable with having um, university records basically being processed and stored at um, at a competitor university even though the infrastructure is compliant with provincial legislation so sometimes it you know it's and it, you know it, it can be just sort of a distrust of collaboration as well with things like um, university records that might impact it people's approaches and and just the other thing I'll say um, in in our context and I've talked with Courtney about this just really briefly, but um, when we're dealing with uh, First Nations and Indigenous uh, collections, um, policies and procedures that enable ownership and control to be maintained by First Nations in co uh, collaboration with um, uh, universities and other uh, infrastructure providers is also an area where, this, where there's kind of an intersection that we're just starting to explore in the Canadian context. So I just thought I'd throw that in there too. Thank you for mentioning that, Corey. That's an interesting, um, interesting aspect that I hadn't hadn't thought about before, but it, um, should have. Um, do you, is that more so with um, digitized materials? Um, yeah, you know, it's it, it's everything, um, and the the biggest issues there are the the sense of communal ownership when. Uh, an artifact or a story or some other representation um, has privacy that isn't um, that where, where access to that information isn't necessarily institutional affiliation or individuals it's a community um, and so you run up against very different sort of understanding of um, access controls uh, even just with um, um, even maybe not the objects but the metadata uh, itself and so trying to accommodate um, uh, that type of uh, privacy where it's not just um, specific to an individual or in, uh, individual identifiable information but it might be at the community level and it creates some problems too because as a public institution you may be subject to freedom of information requests that would expose um, sensitive community data uh, because it's not individually identifiable. So there's some tensions there uh, as well that we're trying to, just starting to kind of sort through. Yeah, it's, it, uh, I would say that from the perspective of an institution that's currently in the process of instituting or um, at least kicking off the institution of uh, 
of protocols for describing those materials, so just managing the metadata. Uh, ultimately, the sort of scenario that you're discussing, Corey, where, where you build out infrastructure to handle the born digital content um, would, would in some ways be easier to communally um, uh, manage as opposed to the scenarios that we're dealing with regarding more traditional materials where, um, you know, co-managing uh, physical content that we've been storing that may or may not be something that we should have access to or should have acquired in certain ways uh, leads to a pretty profound um, and, and, and fraught discussions, I would say, in, in a lot of cases. And so uh, it's, it's interesting to hear that particular perspective because I, I think that going forward, it might provide some opportunities, even with digital surrogates, um, if we were to digitize portions of the collections and then give the, the, the various nations that we're um, speaking with that are the local to our institution, you know, more agency over those, those materials. So um, that would be an interesting infrastructure discussion in and of itself, I would think. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> it's a uh, lot of work to be done in that area for sure. Even just things like digital repatriation of, of uh, I know at the Royal BC Museum, there's uh, audio recordings that have been digitized and lots of sort of fraught issues around ownership and control based on, you know, agreements that were signed decades ago by scholars that maybe didn't have the, you know, the best interests of the community they were working with in mind. I think in a, an adjacent topic to some of what we've been talking about um, is disaster recovery uh, for preservation storage um, and whether it's something that you, uh, a, a storage infrastructure that you are managing uh, your, yourself as a, as, a, um, as a digital unit, um, or as a collections unit, um, or if uh, it's content, or I'm sorry, storage that you're using from a, uh, a campus or organization um, entity external to yours, you know, some sort of shared infrastructure, um, or that you're contracted out to. Um, you know, it's, it's how much do you know about the disaster recovery plans for, for that storage? How do you include um, the disaster plan for for that type of material in your own disaster planning? Is it just sort of, you know, in some ways, distributed digital preservation is disaster planning, um, you know, so unless, you know, it's sort of like that first tier of content that only is kept locally. Um, but I can't get my campus um, IT to share disaster plans um, with me. Uh, you know, that's, it's too, too secure. There's too many other things stored in the data center that um, they, they will not share that. At least I haven't been able to twist arms enough yet um, for them to divulge that information. Um, so how are others sort of dealing with the issue of disaster, um, disaster planning for you know, in regards to how do your preservation storage and, and fits into it all. So Nathan, they're, they're, they have concerns that it might compromise their security by, by sharing that information with you. Is that the idea? Yeah, um, the, the most I've been able to get out of them is the, um, the type of fire suppression system in the data center. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've, I've tried to set up meetings or to get a copy of the disaster um, recovery plan. Um, and and I, I just sort of stop getting responses um, at those points. Um, or I get commitments that people will, will follow up with me and they don't. Um, and, and I know in this building, the, the data center, um, you know, you, you, can't, you can't get in there, um, you know, unless uh, you know, someone's there with you who's already authorized to be in the building. So it's a bit of an assumption on my part that it's because of the general security around the building. 
Um, and so I think if I want to know this, I need to find the right person who, who may have that authorization, um, who can get me through the door. Um, and, um, you know, our, my AD is, and, and Dean's is just, just too busy at this point to, to get them involved. Um, but that's sort of my, my last go-to to try to get that information out of them. But I wonder, do any of us, you know, necessarily know this? Um, I'm the type of person who would love to have this all, all documented um, and have a copy of all this to know. Well, what happens? What happens when the data center goes kablooey or, you know, when there's, uh, an, uh, you know, some of those, some giant um, electromagnetic resonance um, kablooey thing goes off near it and suddenly all the data is gone. Um, what happens or what their plan is? Um, I don't know. We, um, with uh, Artifactual, we worked to basically simulate a, uh, like a loss at the UBC data center to see um, if we could recover from offsite backup. So maybe like a scenario like that might be helpful. Corey, how did you how did you arrange that with them? We, we currently partner with them for our, our Kubernetes instance and, and associated dark cloud storage. Um, is that something that you had to work out a special agreement with them on? Is it something they did at cost? How did that work? Um, well, I think uh, we worked with Justin, um, uh, and he just did it as part of the the service, so there was no uh, additional cost uh, for us. Um, I, there, for all of our sort of users there's like this ticketing system that doesn't get used a lot. So I think we had a little bit of wiggle room there um, for them to spend some time on it, but we just sort of negotiated informally. It's a fabulous idea because I was going to say that from our perspective, we actually, um, because we house the, the storage array in our building as part of the data center that's baked into our kind of physical environs here. Um, and because we've been willing to, uh, work hard to clean up the the type of materials that we were storing and the package of packages of materials that we were storing on the on the campus um, storage array. They've they've actually been pretty forthcoming with us. I mean, I'm not saying that, that we know exactly what's going to go on, but we we know, for instance, um, a whole lot more about the logistics of what would play out if we had to rely on their backups for anything that was stored locally. Um, where it gets a little bit foggier for us, no pun intended, is actually anything that's tied to the cloud. And so that's why it's interesting to hear that they were willing to simulate that sort of um, event. I don't think we're ready in terms of, you know, having still just a nascent relationship with them and, and getting ready to push a lot of porn digital content into our pipe. Um, it, would, it wouldn't be beneficial right now, but it might be something to look at in a year or so. So Nathan, we had very similar uh, situation happening here at UK, um, but it's been a couple years since we first tried to have that conversation with our campus IT uh, group, and we recently got a new CIO. So this is a good reminder that we need to reach out to them and see he's much more open to, to working with us and talking to us. So we need to talk to him about that. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of the whole motivation of why we're throwing copies wherever we can throw copies of stuff for free, other than the content that's sensitive. And then the content that is sensitive, um, we've tossed around the idea of taking our LTO tapes and just shipping them to another repository across the country just for that geographic distribution. But um, we just haven't gotten around to doing that yet. Yeah, we'd actually talked about um, doing a tape exchange with UNLV um, since Nevada is such a large state and we have different um, threats, so to speak. We would at least entertain the idea of going through that sort of scenario. So, I mean, I wonder, too, if there would be a possibility of, of finding like-minded oral history institutions to pursue that with. Um, I'm by no means volunteering us at this juncture. <laughs> Uh, I just I just know that oral history is something that we're struggling with as well because we've got a, a program that was donated um, from a separate university uh, 
uh, uh, entity into the university archives here that was putting together oral histories for a long time. And there's a considerable amount of content there. Um, so it could be that we'd be even in the market for that eventually. I can raise it with our head of special collections, but that may be a real kind of easy way to address that concern. Yeah, it's a good idea. We should, um, yeah, I, I like that idea of, of using it from the oral history perspective. I don't know if, um, I don't know how many other institutions, at least sort of in our region, have content that is quite that sensitive. I don't know. I don't get that sense, but it doesn't matter. It's worth bringing up at regional or national organizations. Um, and I would say, too, that if people are interested in sending tapes here, um, we can do that. Forgive, t forgive my ignorance, but when you, when you ship tapes, do they just sort of sit in a box? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because it's weird. We yeah. Would, yeah, we would essentially put them in an archival box and then um, you know put packaging around that and the assumption is is that that box of tapes sits in the secure climate controlled storage at whatever institution. So I'm wondering if it might be worth pursuing like some kind of and maybe this already happens but an agreement with one of the sort of the regional storage uh, facilities for you know shared print um, initiatives. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. We, um, it gets complicated because we already have an offsite vendor that we contract with. And I don't know how that would play with like university policies on like, there'd be a whole like vendor approval form and all of that. Um, so we were hoping that we could just do like a casual informal trade with another institution and just have an MOU or something, some sort of document. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. Keep it lightweight. Exactly. Um, yeah. But, and we, our regional offsite repository is in a cave and they literally just have stuff on shelves in a cave and it, climate control is great, but it's super dusty. So tape is not going to work for going there. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> I think there's a lot of sneaker net that still goes on, um, you know, where you send in hard drives or tapes around, um, it, it's still pretty valid, I think, too. Um, you know, when you're, especially when you're talking about 10 terabytes of content and stuff, trying to send that with integrity over the over the um, internet is not always um, reliable unless, you know, everyone has, you know, fiber connections with all of these protocols and mechanisms around it to make sure everything is transferring with integrity. Um, it gets to be really, um, really tricky to do, uh, you know, even, even like Amazon and, and, you know, even the big places do it. They send off these snowballs and, and, uh, trucks, um, you know, to, to do your data transfers when they get to be huge because it's so, so much, um, uh, you know, I think I've, there's, I've heard other, other conversations about trying to do similar types of exchanges, um, whether it's tapes or hard drives, um, or even just whole racks, um, you know, storage arrays um, and those types of situations. Uh, Can I jump in? You mentioned Snowball and this is wildly off topic, but we are in the middle of transferring content to a Snowball. And I'm curious if any of you um, have done that before because it's been challenging to say the least. And I was surprised at how difficult it's been. I know that UNLV is transferred to Snowball, Sarah, and so they might be worth, it might be worth trying to get in contact with them. Okay. I think it was a little bit of a challenge for them as well. Okay. They were simply, and I, it, I think it probably depends on the type of data that you're moving and the packaging of that data. Um, uh, in their case, it was relatively homogenous. Uh, we're talking, I think, largely image surrogates from their collections that they captured. Um, but it, I think talking to people like that would be worthwhile. Um, I mean, I, jokingly, I, I, when we recently inked an MOU with our campus IT for our secondary pipe to AWS through Iceland, I told them that I wanted a snowmobile. And they, they seemed excited about it, but I, I don't think we're going to get the tractor trailer, uh, nor are we going to get any, any, um, any snowballs per se. What, what, what kind of challenges have you been running into? So we're transferring oral history content and they're pretty large um, file sizes. So 
around 50 gigs um, and it's ju just the process is really slow so whatever the connection is I mean we're taking that snowball we hooked it up directly to our servers um, and it's we've tried all the different types of connections and it's just going incredibly slow so it's taken us a month and a half to transfer data that should have taken less than a week and it's you know they're comping us the cost so they're not charging us for the excess or the fees for keeping it for longer than we expected but it's um you know we're trying to think carefully if we want to because we were going to order another couple of snowballs to get all of our digital surrogates and just trying to decide if that's something that we want to do or not it is better than uploading through the online interface but it's it's a little we were just all very surprised and we've been collaborating with campus it on it and they too were pretty shocked at it. Yeah, that is fascinating. I mean, even with the size, you'd think that if it was local, that these are all designed around large files. Right. Yeah, so I'll reach out to UNLV and see, and see about that, because we <laughs> kind of like, well, it's our first one, and maybe it's just a lemon, but I, I don't know if that's a thing that exists in that, in that sort of realm, but yeah, the person I'd reach out to, she's not the she's not directly involved in, or wasn't directly involved in loading the snowball up. Um, would be Corey Lang. Corey, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, talk to Corey, Corey about it. Okay. She'd, be, she'd be the good place person to start with. Their their head of library IT was was the person who was ultimately pushing a lot of that content. Okay. But um, I vaguely remember, and it's been a year that they had some some hiccups along the way, but the sort of behavior you're describing seems really strange. Right. Yeah. So thank you. That's good. I'll, I'll reach out to Corey. Um, in, uh, wondering like is grid FTP used in that? I don't know if it is or not. Um, uh, we had, so we have a programmer at the campus IT level who's been doing a lot of the troubleshooting and he's, I don't, yeah, I just don't know that level of detail. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, my guess is that it, it probably does have to do something with the file system and the way that they they uh, validate transfer and so forth. For I mean, it, it sounds like it's something that's just kind of atypical for the file size or configured improperly on their end. Um, but it, it's worth checking into. Sarah, are you transferring directly from the tape? No, from our servers. Okay. Yeah. So it's not the sensitive content. It's just all the other content. I think you just need a snowmobile. I just think the snowball is just not. We thing. want one, right? That's a good, <laughs> that's a legitimate excuse of why we <laughs> a truck sent in. <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate that. Does anyone else have any um, anything they'd like to bring up? Talk about. I'd be curious then to what what level of um if you if you do have some form of uh, distributed preservation, does that at all affect how you do um, any level of back backup, or is it do you completely divorce those in your mind and planning? Um, and when it comes down to backup. Uh, do you do both tape and back um, snapshot type backups um, and just sort of getting into brass tacks, you know, type of, of frequency, you know, if you, if you are using more of a backup approach um, to do sort of a, it's an no, 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 backup is not preservation. I'm not trying to get into that um, um, scenario here. Um, just looking at bits. Um, but if you're trying to, to use more of a backup um, technologies to do replication, um, you know, are you using more of a, a, an incremental, a snapshot, full? Um, uh, there's a lot of different ways to even do 
backup type scenarios where you, you are um, approaching that. Um, and we have, we've had some, some problems just, again, not preservation, but just the backup. Um, I don't know if some sort of idiosyncratic way they use the system here, but um, we have some very large file shares. Um, and I get in trouble if we ever rename a directory because suddenly the backup system sees that as an entirely new directory. And suddenly I've wasted 70 terabytes and the backup system goes crazy replicating off. And, and it's like, what am I supposed to do? I have to reorganize this. I, I can't, I have to, so, you know, to have to like pull down all this content to a local device and then send it back up cleanly somewhere else. It's just like a, it's a pain. It's not preservation. This is a little more, you know, basic and, and brass tacks and just file management. But I'm just wondering if anyone had any thoughts along those lines. It's interesting you bring that up, Nathan. I, uh, here at, at the University of Nevada, Reno, I think that we've planned our systems around trying to leverage uh, snapshot scenarios for anything that we're storing locally um, and then really leveraging distribution and, uh, and a variety of storage in the cloud for our endpoints when it comes to preservation. The one exception to that that's interesting that is kind of an odd, uh, I, I think, artifact of having Islandora as a service that's offered through a vendor in the cloud is that um, the sort of preservation work that we do in, in our repository is hinging increasingly on different processes that um, Amazon puts in place to protect the environment. So we, uh, in, in that particular scenario, um, we have to think very carefully, both in terms of preservation, but also in terms of resource management, about our daily deltas, because the, everything is, is swung around that. So they're gonna measure change on a daily basis within that particular environment, and, uh, and then allocate backups accordingly. That's not something that our vendor can even control from what they've told us. That's really kind of built out in, into whatever computational and storage environment they've created um, in conjunction with AWS. So it's, you know, it's, it's obviously a, a combination of those things. We try and leverage those, those snapshots outside of the repository because we view those as sort of working spaces um, with the exception of the more sensitive materials. You know, we don't typically store things there very long. Um, but like I said, the, the big exception would be that, that Islandor instance, um, which creates all sorts of headaches because we have to track when we upload things because the only way to delete the deltas is to know when we did it. They can't actually see things. The vendor can't see things from their side. It's, it's an AWS kind of visible only thing. It's very strange, um, but it's, it's led to kind of this weird hybrid, uh, or maybe it's not all that weird, but it's this hybrid environment that we've got. Could you repeat um, the second thing you had said right after um, snapshots for locally stored content before you got into the AWS? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that in time to, to get it in the notes. Um, you use snapshots for locally stored content and then because of the daily deltas in AWS, you have to do more um, tracking and management, but there was um, something in between there that I did not capture, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. I, I completely understand. So we, um, <clears throat> uh, for our preservation layer, we've got it broken into two pipes that, that terminate in cloud storage. Uh, I'm sure that there's some backup scenarios that are playing out in those environments. Oh, actually, I know there are, um, that are AWS-based and involve kind of pushing out to different data centers. But I don't view them as, as snapshot. Um, I view them as really hinging more on, on that geographical distribution. Um, we have to, to some degree, trust that the parties involved are doing their due diligence in those scenarios, but I wouldn't say that we're leaning heavily on, on whatever sort of day-to-day -day process they have in place for backup purposes. Instead, we're, we're dealing on 
we're dealing with distribution either in terms of geographical distribution or distribution in terms of service. Um, the, the latter would, or the former would involve obviously different data centers and different locations. The, um, the latter would involve distinctions between the say uh, S3 and frequent buckets and Glacier. So we, we, we use that sort of distribution in terms of the endpoints in our preservation layer to really facilitate that. But um, at, that, at that juncture, you know, I, I don't doubt that they're doing similar, that AWS may be offering similar sort of um, uh, management of, of different processes, but I also, um, we don't interact with them at that level because we're, we're filtering this through vendors or processes. So we're largely viewing it as a distribution question. Thank you. Yep. What is it the AWS is um, uh, changing or, or, or different or um, that they're, so it had to do with how they're um, managing their environmental impact um, in relation to the daily deltas? Uh, I'm, I'm not 100% clear because we haven't had, uh, we're, we're contracting with Discovery Gardens um, for our Island Dora instance and mm -hmm. It's been a bit of a struggle to get a sense of exactly what's happening there. This issue arose because when we um, when we pursued our, an, uh, an extension of our contract with them, they were concerned that the price was going to scare us off because the repository had grown. A lot of that growth was reflect, reflected in the fact that they were holding on to those deltas. Um, so those backups were going along with the environment and uh, with the production environment that is and was causing it to grow and that growth was then reflected in in the cost um the the issue that we were running into more than anything to be honest nathan was that those the, the backups that were being created in in that scenario it wasn't as though um the the vendor in this case discovery gardens could determine um, they just saw a big pool of deltas. They didn't see that they were associated with any given day. And so they, we could ask them to delete something, but either they had, it was kind of an all or nothing scenario, unless we could target them to a particular day and say, on April 15th, we, 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 we conducted, you know, or we ingested, you know, a, a great deal of material. And so therefore, please, please delete those deltas. Um, and this was just baked into the service that they had configured um, through AWS. And so it was rather opaque on all sorts of levels. It was opaque in sense of what was visible to the vendor. And, um, and while we really appreciate, I'm, I'm sure that the, the, the fact that we could possibly back something up, it's a cumbersome process. But I think it reflects that the fact that this is a software as a service as opposed to software as a service and, and maybe some of the parties involved um, haven't quite gotten things to the point where they feel comfortable um, sharing information or maybe they just don't have the information given the nature of the environment itself or the, the cloud that they're operating in. Does that clarify? A bit. Um, or maybe I'm not getting your question. Um, no, 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 it, it, you helped. Um, and you said some of this was going into Glacier, I think? Um, that's, a sep that's a separate pipe. What oh, we're separate. Talking about, yeah, this is just the repository itself. We, we have separate pipes for Archivematica that lead it through Dark Cloud into S3 and um, Glacier, and that's a separate process from the repository itself. Okay. I know Glacier has a, um, um, like a retention policy, essentially. You, you, you stuff goes in, and I think it's 120 days um, is a minimum. I was wondering if that had something to do with it, but uh, that was a separate separate pipeline, he said. So, but um, 
when you first were talking about the environment, I was thinking it was like like climate change environment and, and oh, something no. they were they were trying to do to reduce their carbon footprint <clears throat> or something. Um, but this helps. Yeah, good yeah I get no sense of that. No, I mean it's it's uh, it's it's a little complicated on our end because um, this this is a, a first for us to push into a, a complicated push a complicated stack into the cloud through a vendor. Um, I mean, obviously they've got a great deal of experience with this sort of thing, um, but because it's a computational environment, in addition to the storage, I think it just adds layers of complexity to everything. Anything else from anybody? Well, um, I guess I will start to wrap up here. Um, uh, we have, um, we are still looking for some um, facilitators. Uh, Corey and I are going to start uh, reaching out to people um, directly over uh, the next few weeks. Um, so if you get contacted, um, uh, please, uh, please say yes. You would, you would love to facilitate a conversation. Um, uh, we look forward to your acceptance of our invitations. Hopefully, um, also uh, keep an eye out um, and submit those some proposals for the NDSA DigiPres in Tampa, Florida this October. Um, on the 28th, proposals are due um, for some sessions. Um, Corey and I still need to um, uh, check in, but uh, we'll probably will be doing our October meeting um, in lieu of a call. We will have uh, an in-person uh, sort of working lunch as we did last year. Um, we'll repeat that again this year during um, during DigiPres. Um, we tr had hoped to be able to sort of have a, a, um, a remote session last year where people could call in um, in lieu of um, one of our normal remote calls. Um, but there were some issues with Wi-Fi at the venue last year. Um, so let's hope that they'll be a little better this year so more people can participate. Um, but if there wasn't, uh, aren't any more additional topics, I um, guess we can bid adieu. Anything else from you, Corey? Sorry, here I am. Just unmuting various things. Yeah, no, nothing from me, Nathan. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll get uh, the recording um, up on YouTube sometime in the next couple of days. Thanks, all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks. Thank you.